Hello, 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 everyone. This is Nick Fatuni from Next Gen They Care. Just because I have some time today, I decided to record two videos. As you can see, same outfit as the previous video, right? So before, in our little series, we were talking about children needs. We had a very first video where we're talking about the general needs of every child. Very important, very nice, but not very specific. Then we broke it down into, for example, toddlers, preschoolers. And just for the sake of me trying to help you guys out, I will be talking today about infants. Just remembering that uh, here at Next Gen Day Care, we do care for toddlers, we do care for preschoolers, and we do care about before and after school care, kids, kindergarten plus. There's going to be a separate video for those needs, but we do not tend for infants. We do not care for infants, right? So regardless of that, there are, of course, literature all out there that you can read, etc. But Nick here decided to make your life a bit easier to give you, whew, that's a lot, the nine most important uh, developmental needs for infants. And let's start with infants. What is that age group? Again, because of where they care, we use Child Care Alberta definitions of the age. And infants are basically any child that goes all the way from zero years old to about less than 19 months old. All right, 19 plus, that's usually when the toddler life stage starts. And as you might imagine, of course, an infant is not much than just a little baby, a big chunk of fluffy meat that we want to bite all the time. But what can you do to help with the development, right? I've talked to a bunch of friends throughout my life and some uh, people doing university times, etc. And they believe that they, they cannot do much when a child is an infant because a child doesn't even have a brain developed enough to learn and i understand that but here is the deal everything that you are going to be doing to the infant goes for one specific goal and the goal is to allow the unconscious brain of the child of the infant to be stimulated enough so it becomes aware of the existence of different objects, different shapes, different colors, different temperatures, and so on, that the conscious mind cannot really process yet. But you, I'm going to use a biological term here, you are at least priming the learning. You are telling the unconscious brain or the subconscious brain, hey, this exists. If you ever find this in the future, at least you know what it is. And it's kind of a tough science to measure, right? Science does like things that are measurable, that are touchable. But it's it's still much better, my personal opinion, if you do something than if you don't do anything, right? At this stage, all we can do, and I'm going to be a bit dramatic here, so take it with a grain of salt. All we can do is expose our children and hope that they're going to be taking a little bit of learning that comes with whatever you're exposing your child to, right? So let's get started. It's nine. We're going to go fast. Some are small, some are long. So let's get going. First things first is number one, we need to give our child, our infant, a very rich environment with sensory experiences, all right? And yes, I'm talking about different colors. Yes, I'm talking about different textures. Yes, I'm talking about different temperatures. All right. All of that. So again, the child can be exposed to those things and understand that, I don't know, maybe there's a bit of a wristed tough object hurts. And that's something that our child really understands well when a child is infant, right? What is hurt and what is not hurting? And usually what hurts creates a big cry, right? And if you allow a child to experience those things, again, you start priming the brain to understand what is good, what is not, what is warm, what is not. And that kind of creates a bit of leg up for, for example, the toddler stage where they tend to make sense of those subconscious learnings that will happen during this exposure during the infant period Alrighty, so yeah number one just bring all sorts of sensory experience experiences you can 
different materials, different texture, different types of colors, different types of temperatures, things that it can touch, things that it can bite, things that rub around the body and so on, just so you can expose them to the majority of those uh, sensory experiences you can. Number two falls a little bit under the sensory experience too, but then we go a little bit further into mixing sensors sensory experiences with motor experiences, right? So you want to bring varied materials, varied experiences, different shapes, different weights, different grips in an object because of the material. So the child, the infant can understand how they will interact with those things. That's when they start understanding what is light, what is heavy, what they can move, what they cannot move. And even a very rudimentary problem solving kind of a situation if they get fixated with a given object that, for example, they cannot move or they can throw and see what's going to happen. Right. But in this case, while we're still exploring a little bit of the sensory experience, you have to bring the motor experience to it. That's why different weights, that's why different shapes, different sizes will allow a child to start getting a grip of those concepts. Alrighty? Number three, trust. That's when we start talking something that we already talked a long time ago in our previous videos about children at any age uh, stage and group allows us to create a sense of trust. Alrighty. It's important because they need to know what sort of people it's safe for them and what sort of people they can rely on. Alrighty. Of course, family becomes the main part of that experience of trusting, right? But that can be for, for example, your caregivers at the daycare. It could be a doctor. It could be a, another, like a distant family, right? Uh, the adjacent family, if you may, could be a friend. So understanding that a lot of humans actually might not pose a threat allows the child to develop that sense of trust. And that, of course, in the long run, makes the child, makes the infant understand that, okay, so I should be able to trust humans if he was or she was exposed to a lot of trusting people or if that didn't happen then chances are the child will always going to grow a bit suspicious of all the other children mother uh, adults that are out there because they might be cause of pain of hurt etc so trust here is important it's like playing with your pet in a way talking about dogs cats right Usually when you just get a new dog or a new cat, they might be a little, I don't know what's going on here, but it gets to a point where your dog just jumps in your bed and sleeps on top of you. Your cat starts, you know, like uh, doing the little nibbles and bites on you because they know that there is no hurt that's going to come after doing that, right? So even though I understand humans and animals, uh, although humans are animals, they have different ideas over it. It's very important to at least understand that this develop of trust works in fairly similar levels between us and other animals. All right. So the fourth one falls into a, a umbrella, like a branch, let's say, of trust. So they need to have their individual needs met. And that becomes a bit of a kind of an oxymoron, in my opinion, when we're talking about uh, infants, because their only needs that they have is basically eating, crying and pooping, right? So if you are the parent and if you are meeting all those requirements, then it's good. Your child is clean, which means less diseases. Your child's fed, which means building blocks for the child to grow and develop biologically, right? And then, of course, there is always the social, the nurturing, the caring that uh, comes with it, right? Those are not needs where you're going to see an immediate response, but those, again, start priming the brain to allow the child to understand what is caring, what is nurturing. If the child needs someone to fall back into when there is a big scare, what is the person? And then again, trust comes into it and then care becomes a secondary part of it, right? So first I trust, and then if anything goes wrong, 
I need to know who are the people that I'll go to because I know they will care for me. Alrighty? Number five, routines. And when I say routines, I really mean everything, guys. All right? It's very important for the child to have routines about eating, about sleeping, about grooming, diapering, playing, because the child then starts not only developing the sense of time, but routines help the brain to create those little boxes of like, ooh, this is now time to brush teeth. Ooh, this is now time to go and play. Ooh, this is now time to eat, which allows even you as a parent to have a bit of a I'm not gonna say break because usually infants are fairly unpredictable, right? But it allows you to have that uh, peace of mind that things will happen in a specific fashion. All right. Plus, raising a child to understand the value of routines this early in life allows them to remember or even at least have a sense that routines are important and creating those divisions will allow them to develop their self-help skills, sensory uh, connection with the world, and even understanding of, oh, now is the time to go, you know, have some food because now is lunchtime, because this is basically my lunchtime that I always had and I always will have. And I'm going to talk about developing uh, factors of older children. A lack of routine and children doing whatever they want, whenever they want, is usually highly correlated with obesity, with uh, possible diseases that might happen, bad eating habits, uh, ADHD, and so on, right? So routines do help children to understand that the world is a bit uh, controllable to them. And that allows them to have a little bit of a grip in what's going on. And the same goes for toddlers, right? Give the routine, create that sense of control that can be used for other ages in the future. Number six, reciprocal play. Classic peekaboo, all right? It's a situation where the adult tries to create a situation that the child will react and then the adult needs to react to the child's reaction, right? So the infant in that situation, when you hide, the child's like, oh my God, I don't know where my friendly face is. So what's going to happen? It's going to start getting a bit scared, a bit anxious even. And then when you release your hands and you say the peekaboo, the child then starts understanding like, oh, it was just a ruse. I don't need to be afraid, right? And that's when the child might start laughing. That's when the child might start smiling. And even if it cries, it is a little bit of an idea to grow those specific behaviors into something that might be of interest to the child, right? So that play also teaches the child, the infant, to look into specific cues from the adults, start learning facial expressions again in a very unconscious way the child is exposed to, right? And allows them to be a little more versed in the verse itself, the universe of what is to be human, what is to be a little person. Alrighty. Number seven. And I know that many people might be a little skeptical about it, but very language interaction. I'm going to tell you my story that will elucidate all of that. As you guys know, I'm Brazilian. My mother language is Portuguese. But my mom used to read stories in English to me after her fifth month of pregnancy all the way until my preschool age. Three, four years old. But I don't remember, right? But that's what she told me. And funny enough, I always had some sort of a an easier than normal time, especially compared to my friends uh, in different age groups, right? With English than, you know, a person that was never exposed to it. And why is that? It's mainly because you're giving your brain, you're exposing your brain to that different type of language. Your brain, if it starts proliferating, if it starts growing, it tries to absorb all the information that is around. And then eventually in the next stage called the pruning phase, it will only prune all those learnings that were actually not very useful. So that's why it's very important to expose children, especially in this case, uh, infants, to a very types of language. If you are 
you know, like foreigners like me uh, in a different country, yeah, teach your modern, modern language and teach, of course, the language that will be used in the day to day. And when I say teach, I don't mean like let's sit down and let's learn the ABCs. No, it's again, allow them to listen to the language, to get used to the sounds, to the candents and so on. Alrighty. Number eight, freedom of movement. And I'm not saying just, you know, let your infant to roam free in the house and do whatever they want. No. Create a safe space where the child can move around so the child discovers his or her own body and test his or her own limits. All right? That allows, again, even as we talked about uh, before, a little bit of the self-help development skills, right? A child might start mimicking mom and dad when starts uh, getting up, uh, you know, to walk instead of crawling because mom and dad does it. But they will only feel safe and secure to do so in an environment that will allow them to start exploring without hurting themselves, right? You don't want your child to start to get up and then out of the blue falls into a hard ground. It will be very nice if the ground is a bit, you know, cushioned, where that becomes more of a fun experience, more than a, a scare, than a physical hurt for the sake of it, right? And last but not the least, number nine, we need to understand a little bit of the awareness for the infants. And how does that work in terms of the connection with the adults? Separation anxiety, stranger anxiety, and all sorts of uh, empathetic connections that might happen. The broken anxiety is very common. It happens throughout many, many age groups. Uh, we see that a lot here at daycare. But it's a situation where your child out of the blue starts crying or creating a kind of a, a tantrum, if you may, for an infant where it doesn't want to be away from you, the parent, the caregiver, right? Or even when a stranger comes in, then there's an anxiety because the child was never exposed to other stranger people. So the child doesn't know what to do, starts crying, it's so bad, right? And as I know it hurts for a lot of parents and maybe a lot of people might look at me and say like, you don't know what you're talking about, Nick. But it's a situation where I personally believe that you should let it happen and allow the child to sort those things through. So you know that after birth, maybe parents are not getting a lot of sleep. So if you are trying to create that separation where the child is leaving, sleeping in a different room now, it might be a good idea just to hold your horses there, mom and dad, because yeah, crying is going to happen. And the cry is just a signal for the child to call parents in to support the child. If parents do that all the time, not only they're going to be having terrible sleep habits again, right? But they're also not going to allow the child to understand that it's okay to have that separation anxiety and that they will be okay on their own. And the same idea comes to the stranger anxiety as well. It is always good to have a new person coming in, the child, the infant to be exposed to that uh, new person. Yeah, the infant can cry, the infant can pull up a tantrum, no big deal. It's important that the infant pulls through that on her own or even a little bit of support from the parents in soothing voices, baby speech, and so on. But those are events that are important to happen just so your child, again, gets a bit of a leg up and understanding that it is okay to be alone. It is okay to meet new people. Sounds good. And those were the needs of the infants. I hope you like this video. Make sure that you like, make sure that you subscribe, leave a comment. Let's start a conversation about things that you might have seen in your infant. All right. And don't forget, we're always here to help because Next Gen Care cares for you and the families that are out there. And with that in mind, I'll see you in the next video.